Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 962 for July 24th, 2022. Coming up in a few minutes. A lot of them sound a lot like the complex liqueurs like Chartreuse and Benedictine and some of the Italian Amari. And uh, it would be fun to try out some of them to see if uh, they were legitimately <laughs> tasty at the end of the day or if they just had a lot of stuff piled on top of each other. Doctors and pharmacists of ancient times have a lot in common with today's bartenders. They were mixing up botanicals and spices with alcohol back then to find cures for various ailments, some successful and some not so successful. Camper English has been studying the history of alcohol's use in medicine, and his new book, Doctors and Distillers, goes all the way back to some of the oldest medical texts ever written to look at that history. I'll talk with him in a few minutes on Whiskey Cast in depth. We'll also have the What I'm Tasting This Week department, a big debate over plastic Glen Cairns in your voice, behind the label, and much more. The news is next on this week's Whiskey Cast. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. People never forget the person who introduced them to Redbreast. And then those people go on to introduce others to Redbreast. And soon the flock has grown exponentially. It's like a pyramid scheme. Without any of the bad stuff, of course. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. Gabriel Cartarella here with Dewar's Whiskey, inviting you to enjoy this episode of WhiskeyCast with a glass of Dewar's the most awarded blended Scotch whiskey in history. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by the Dalmore. The American Craft Spirits Association handed out its annual awards Saturday night during the annual ACSA convention in New Orleans. The Huber family's Starlight Distillery in Indiana took home Best of Show honors for its Carl T. Single Barrel Bourbon, which also won Best Whiskey honors. Pittsburgh's Wiggle Whiskey won category awards, not for its whiskeys, but for its peach brandy and tomorrow vermouth. And Jackie Summers won the Innovation Award for his Sorel Liqueur. We have a link to the complete list of medal and award winners in the show notes for this episode at whiskeycast.com. Ticket sales are strong for the annual Kentucky Bourbon Festival, with about 60 days to go until the bourbon world gathers in Bardstown. Tickets go on sale next Monday for the festival's special seminars, and Bourbon Festival President Randy Prasa outlined some of the new changes for this year as the festival continues to go through an evolution. Considering, you know, last year we were $20 for the three-day tickets, plus then you had to buy the sampling tickets once you got inside, and this year it's $125 and includes all your sampling for all three days. Uh, I mean, it, it's a great value. It comes out to about $42 a day uh, for unlimited sampling of 49, I think, at last count, different distilleries. And each one of them will be bringing between two and four brands. So, I mean, if you think about it, you have 150 whiskeys uh, available. So that's great. I mean, the VIP, of course, sold out within an hour or two of going on sale, which is uh, consistent with what we've done. But uh, no, we're, I mean, we're probably about 80, 75, 80% sold out. Uh, for the regular three-day tasting tickets, so very strong, 60 days out. Was there any pushback about the price increase this year? None. I mean, there were people obviously just said, oh, okay, that's too rich for my blood. We're not going to do that. But then my mentality on that is that they're probably not the enthusiasts that we want to try to build this event for and that who the distilleries want to talk to. And of course, you know, this year, not only are we doing the sampling again, that are included in the tickets, as I mentioned, but they're for the first time ever in probably anywhere in, in the U S so you're actually going to be able to buy bottles and take them with you here. So that's a game changer for everybody, for the consumer, for the distillery. And then for me as the event producer, it's a, it's a big change for us. Let's talk about that uh, bottle sales, because this is something you'd been working towards for a couple of years now, right? Correct. I mean, when you think about three years ago, 2019, the last year, 
of the older format. You couldn't even come to the bourbon festival and drink bourbon on the lawn. And we had 11 distilleries involved. And now fast forward, we had 34 distilleries last year. Sampling was now approved and legal. This year, we've got just under 50. We may end up with 50 distilleries. So the distilleries are clearly seeing this as an opportunity to not just sample and engage, but also as a hopefully to come out of the festival as, uh, you know, cash positive. The real key this year is the fact that people can come in and buy the bottles directly from the distilleries. I mean, no one else in the country can do that, only in Kentucky. Um, So you've got your DSP providers that will be selling directly from their booths. You can walk up to a Four Roses or a Maker's Mark or a Jim Beam and buy, taste a sample, buy a bottle. You can buy up up to nine bottles. We'll have lockers on site so people that don't want to have to go carry it around or go to their car, there'll be a limited number of lockups so people can kind of do that. That's the big thing. And then, of course, the NDPs will also be able to have bottles on site and they'll be sold through our bottle shop. So last year, the single barrels that the KBF picked with the different distilleries, we had 10. This year, we've got 20 of the single barrels. Plus, we'll have a space for the other distilleries that don't have their DSPs where they can buy the bottles uh, directly from our bottle shop. So that's big. I mean, for us to be able to not only have the sampling, but have people able to directly go right to cons- being consumers and taking it home, that's, that's, that's huge for us, for everyone. Tell me about the new events that go on sale August 1st. These are not VIP events, are they? Or are these uh, separate tickets compared to the uh, that still require a general admission ticket? Right, Mark. These are upgrades that anybody that has a ticket to get into the festival can can upgrade their experience. So Thursday night, Bourbon in the Air, which which was one of the more popular events we did last year. It's 600 people, very limited. All of the distillery executives and the the corporate sponsors is kind of their kickoff party. But it's kind of a preview for the guests. And it's also a trial run to make sure the the distilleries are, you know, getting into the sink of things. Um, So that will be, and it's catered. It it really is a really cool evening. That's Thursday evening, the 15th. So technically the night before we open. And then Friday, uh, you'll have all the premium education sessions that will be going on sale for the weekend. And then for the afternoon, since we're closing at six this year, that's one of the big things. We're going noon to six instead of 10 to 10, like last year noon to six. So from 1230 to two o'clock on Friday, the 16th, Bardstown Bourbon Company is going to be doing a a pairing sampling culinary uh, showcase. Uh, And then that same day, we clear out the tent and the catering comes in and resets for Jim Beam or James B. Beam. Uh, They'll be on there from 430 till we close at six. So that'll be the two premium distillery showcases on Friday. Excited about that. And then Saturday, we do it again, 1230 to 2 will be Old Forester. So Chris Morris and, and Brown Foreman will be featuring the 1870, 1897, 1910, and 1920, along with culinary pieces. And then, again, we wipe the tent clean and reset it for 430 to 6 on Saturday night is the rabbit hole. So they will be doing their four primary expressions and, and pairing them with food. And then we do it all over again and clear that. And Sunday, really excited about this one, we're doing a Sunday brunch it's going to be called bourbon benedictine and bacon but it's featuring mixtures and if you know andrea wilson andrea was so excited about this opportunity because they love to pair and combine and really kind of showcase the culinary side with mixtures so um so a few new the bartisan bourbon company the the old forester and the mixtures are new last year we had beam and rabbit hole in the evening slots we just moved them up to to kind of anchor the uh, the Friday and Saturdays this year. So all of those, and I think 14 different premium educational experiences will be going all on sale on August 1st. There's a link for more details in the show notes for this episode at whiskeycast.com. A couple of weeks ago, we reported on Art Begg's sale of a single cask from 1975 for around $19.2 million. We now know that some of that money will be going back to Isla, the Glen Marangi Company has said it plans to donate one million pounds from the sale of that cask to various causes on the island. The distillery will work with local leaders to determine where the money should go, and the donations will take place over the next five years. In other news, Gordon and McPhail is releasing an unusual single cask bottling from Strath Isla. It's unusual because it's not being labeled as a Strath Isla single malt. Instead, it will carry the name Milton. That's because the cask was filled in 1949, the same year Milton Distillery's owners went into administration. That's the U.K. equivalent of bankruptcy. 
Chivas Brothers acquired the distillery a year later and changed the name to Strathyla in 1951. As for the whiskey, it spent 72 years in a first fill sherry punch and cask and was bottled at 48.6% ABV. Only 180 bottles will be available worldwide. The UK price is 50,000 pounds a bottle. That's about $65,000 US. I received a sample the other day, and I'll share my tasting notes for it in a few minutes. Gordon and McPhail's Ben Romick Distillery is releasing its second annual batch of Ben Romick 40 years old. The whiskey won Best in Show Honors at this year's San Francisco World Spirits Competition. It'll be available globally in limited amounts, with a recommended retail price of 2,000 pounds a bottle. You can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com and on our social media timelines. The news is brought to you by the Dalmore. Hello, Richard Patterson here, master distiller, master blender for the Dalmore. You know, whenever the team and I are in the world sharing our exceptional single malt, we like to keep in touch with Mark Gillespie and the latest news from Whiskey Cast. Time now for the Whiskey Cast calendar of events brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling. Whiskey Live Perth is coming up on August 5th and 6th in Australia. Swig and Sabre takes place in Portland, Oregon on the 12th. The Whiskey Fringe kicks off that same day in Edinburgh, Scotland and runs through the 14th. Los Angeles Magazine kicks off its annual series of whiskey festivals on the 19th in downtown L.A., Spirits Votland takes place in Greis, Germany on the 19th and 20th. The Bourbon Women's Annual Symposium Conference is August 25th through the 28th in Louisville, Kentucky. Just Whiskey Hamburg takes place that same weekend in Hamburg, Germany. If you're organizing a whiskey event, let us know about it. We'll be glad to add it to the searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. The calendar of events is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of the Virginia Rye Whiskey. You'll find their Roundstone Rye at fine whiskey shops in 26 U.S. states, three continents, and online. Visit the new buyvirginiarye.com site for more details, and please drink responsibly. Dewar's master blender Stephanie McLeod's innate curiosity, combined with her passion for whiskey maturation, cask finishing and blending, has created some truly incredible expressions for Dewar's Scotch whiskey. It's also earned her four consecutive Master Blender of the Year titles at the International Whiskey Competition, making her the first person to achieve such an accolade. Her innovative spirit is the inspiration behind the ultra-premium Dewar's Double Double 32 year, the highest rated blended scotch whiskey in the world with a score of 94.4. So whether you consider yourself a whiskey connoisseur or just want to find an exciting new whiskey experience, consider one of Stephanie's other masterful expressions, including Dewar's 15 year, Double Double 21 year, or Dewar's 8 year Mizunara cask finish and discover just how rewarding curiosity can be be. Enjoy responsibly. Whiskey Cast In Depth is brought to you by Mortlock and the Classic Malts lineup. The histories of alcohol and medicine have been intertwined for centuries. Many of the earliest medical practitioners were also distillers, using their stills to find the essences of everything they could in their search for cures. Then, of course, there are also the prescriptions for whiskey and other spirits that doctors issued routinely during Prohibition. Camper English's new book, Doctors and Distillers, looks at how alcohol has been part of medicine since those early days. We spent some time on a Zoom call the other day. This obviously required a lot of research. How long did you spend going through ancient medical texts and things like that to research this book? Well, I spent probably close to a full year researching it before I really started writing most of it. And then that was another year. So it was a lot of research. The first year I was also trying to save money to take the time off to write it. Um, but then we had a pandemic, which meant I didn't leave the house a lot for the year of writing it. So one very intense year of research and then 
really two more years of just reading uh, nightly. And then writing. And then writing. Well, writing was in that, is, is in that last year, along with a lot more research. I thought I was done. It turns out I was not done. It turns out I really don't like being wrong. So I fact-checked everything and, and went through more sources and uh, tried to be as accurate as possible. Originally, I thought I was going to have a light and breezy little book, like fun fact, you know, whiskey was used against rattlesnake bites, but ultimately it came up with this very much uh, longer and more intense uh, book of information. But I think that works well for the reader because it really has a lot of information, but still with that breezy style to it that you like. Yeah, I do. I mean, I like to have fun with it. I think I like, you know, gross stories of medicine and uh, bleeding and explosions and all of that stuff. And so I try to infuse the book with a lot of the, the, the fun and goofy stuff in the history of medicine while putting it in the the larger framework of the understanding of medicine, how that changed over the millennia and how it took on uh, different forms in different parts of the world in different times. So I think the uh, origin of the corpse reviver has to be the use of actual corpses in uh, medicines and cocktails of the day back in the medieval times, right? Well, there were certainly a lot of corpses used <laughs> in medicine. The I'm kidding, of, of course. <laughs> the corpse survivor itself was, you know, for the hangover corpse. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, more, more corpses than expected in this book. <laughs> it seems as though the medical texts of medieval times and uh, even dating farther back as far as we can find written word, would have made for a really good cocktail recipe these days with all the uh, botanicals and everything that uh, doctors of the time were using. It almost seems like doctors were the first bartenders. It really does. A lot of those old recipes where it was pretty much every spice that you can think of and half the herbs that you might be able to recognize today, all thrown together to be a cure-all or anti-poison or anti-venom. And a lot of them sound a lot like the complex liqueurs like chartreuse and Benedictine and some of the Italian Amari. And uh, it would be fun to try out some of them to see if uh, they were legitimately (laughs) tasty at the end of the day, or if they just had a lot of stuff piled on top of each other. And the genesis of all this is that uh, water was not safe to drink back in those times. So alcohol was, right? Yeah, absolutely. All the prescriptions, such as they were for any kind of medicine for all of the early period, uh, started with something liquid. And that liquid was usually not water. It was usually beer, um, particularly in ancient Egypt. It was wine in the Greek and Roman times, and then eventually becomes spirits um, in the Middle Ages and, and beyond that. And so all of it was to avoid drinking water because they would have said, you know, put it in water and drink it, but they don't. They specify uh, the whatever the local beverage was throughout history. And so it looks like these are drink recipes, but it's sort of like saying mix it with water, but no one was drinking the water. A lot of these chemicals, though, a lot of these uh, herbs and things actually do have antimicrobial properties or uh, antiviral properties to them that we really didn't uh, use today, but that could be used in some cases, right? I think so. Um, uh, Most every spice, and I had no idea before I was researching the book, uh, most every spice is antimicrobial and therefore probably helped to extend the life of the beer and wine uh, medicines that they were used in. And uh, so that's definitely, you know, something real that happened. I don't know how antimicrobial they are. If it, you know, if uh, you put nutmeg in your beer, if it's going to last an extra week or not, but it might've helped a little anyway. Whereas we really think of hops as the biggest antimicrobial preservative for beer. It helps beer last longer, but wormwood was used in that same way um, as well in beer, as well as all different sorts of herbs and spices. Let's turn to uh, 
the science of all this now. It turns out that a lot of the leading scientists of the day were using beer and wine in their experiments, uh, such as Pasteur, right? Yeah, Pasteur, like his whole career is really based on uh, on beer and, and wine. That's what he really studied and kept coming back to. And that's what he was concerned with preserving uh, initially and extending its life. And in initial and then later experiments after he had had massive success with the germ theory of fermentation and the germ theory of disease, he returns to more commercial aspect of um, preventing spoilage in beer and wine and wrote a book on each and then, you know, went on to do other uh, amazing feats of science throughout the rest of his life. Truly an, an, an incredible uh, scientist that I had not nearly enough appreciation for until I got to the end of that chapter. What other scientific advances can we attribute to the drinks industry or at least the drinks research by those early pioneers in science? Well, uh, a big one was both studying fermentation and studying naturally carbonated water that led to all of Pasteur's observations on germ theory of disease, particularly how yeast fermenting, uh, and there wasn't really a great understanding of what that process was, how that was different than naturally fizzy water from springs like, um, I don't think Evian is naturally carbonated, uh, or maybe it is, but the, the naturally carbonated springs, how that is a purely chemical process, and yet fermentation is a biological process, and that separation led to a lot of discoveries. So one of which was just um, that air is not just air, <laughs> that air uh, is made up of multiple different gases and understanding what those gases were. So the big one, of course, is carbon dioxide, which uh, was, I want to say discovered, but figured out by uh, scientists, you know, leaning their head over the fermentation bat. And some of the early experiments, such as they were, were um, holding holding a mouse above a beer fermentation bat and seeing that it suffocated. And so they knew that air was different air than the regular air that we breathe, uh, which led to many, many experiments that uh, show the gases as we understand them today, that air is made up of a mixture of other gases. And then that further led to the study of um, anesthesiology and how the utility of different gases for, for different things. Such as? Such as, well, carbon dioxide for carbonation, I suppose, but also um, they were looking at... Um, well, that's where we got ether and things like that from. Exactly. Right? And nitrous, nitrous oxide to, for, for the dentist's office. Scientists had a real um, big party when they were studying gases and learned to separate them out um, and create uh, isolated gases through experiments. And then they would huff the gases and just find out what happened. <laughs> and not always to successful uh, conclusions. Certainly not. Certainly not. How do we get whiskey into all of this? Because whiskey is a relatively recent phenomenon compared to beer and wine, which date back to before... Before written records, before, really. Before no. written records, really. Uh, whiskey doesn't. But how do we get whiskey into the medicinal mix? Well, uh, in the first place, all distilled spirits in general were a creation of the alchemists uh, who were using distillation for all sorts of different experiments and to make uh, using it in metallurgy and mineralogy and just to separating different materials before wine was successfully distilled and concentrated into brandy. It was used for things like rose water by the Arabic uh, scientists of the Islamic golden era from 700 to 1200. At the end of that time uh, were now shining our light on uh, Southern Italy, looking at the medical alchemists. And so they're making uh, essential oils, essentially, and hydrosols from water-based distillation of every plant they could find, and also animals that they could find. They would distill blood and eggs and hair and see what that quote-unquote medicine was useful for. Well, they once the distillation technology was good enough that they were able to separate out alcohol from 
the water in distilling wine, though they didn't really recognize it as such, they um, were like, wow, we have created the the best medicine. This stuff makes you feel great. And um, it was over the next couple hundred years, there were more comments on the medicinal value of distilled alcohol. Uh, Initially, wine was distilled and then beer was distilled in other parts of the world. Later, we see um, apples and things like that being distilled as well as honey, um, just taking form in, in different parts of the world. And early recipes for Irish whiskey are really interesting in that they all included some kind of sweetener like raisins and dates uh, and honey and usually a little bit of flavoring like cinnamon and ginger. And I thought that was really interesting because I had never read about that before. And so we saw recipes for Irish whiskey before we see any mention of scotch, at least in the books that I looked at. And when we get to America and we have a lot more documentation because that's more recent, uh, we see whiskey being used for everything uh, in the same way that wine and beer were used in ancient Egypt and ancient Greece and Rome. Whiskey was the default liquid that all medicinal preparations were added to um, or, or based on in the case of the cure-all patent medicines that came about in the later 1700s and 1800s. So whiskey was just the, you know, it was like step one, you know, grab some whiskey and step two might be add hot pepper to it or something else in order to make the cures in uh, Western, you know, cowboy medicine. And then we get to the snake oil salesman of the time who were literally putting snake oil into this patent medicine of theirs, right? They were, except for the the main person who um, became known as the snake oil salesman, who is the where our modern um, understanding of it as being a scam comes from. He demonstrated actually putting a, a snake into uh, alcohol in, I think it was a World's Fair or something like that to show how his medicine was made. But then the United States government tested it and said, you know, this oil doesn't contain any snakes. This is uh, a fraudulent medical practice. Not enough snakes. Needs more snakes. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> sort of like more cowbell, huh? Yes, exactly. Your snakes were the cowbell of medicine. <laughs> Before Prohibition, though, whiskey was not itself considered medicine until Prohibition, right? Well, it didn't need to be prescribed specifically as medicine until Prohibition made whiskey otherwise illegal. Um, and it was really interesting that the uh, medical establishment had only just um, in the, I believe in the early 1900s, um, taken alcohol and, and whiskey specifically out of the, the general um, pharmacology, the, the, the list of approved medicines. And then prohibition passed and they took a pole and put it back in as, as a medicine. They said, well, you know, it actually is useful for, for some things enough that we want to be able to prescribe it. So uh, it's, it's use as medicine uh, sort of changed back and forth a few times. Leading to the phrase physician heal thyself, right? <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's works for me. I self-prescribe whiskey on occasion. <laughs> I don't know about you. (laughs) But does whiskey have any medicinal properties to it? Is there any legitimate benefit that you found in your research? I know that uh, alcohol critics will say absolutely not, but some people swear by it. Well, it's all alcohol has utility in the practice of medicine rather than it necessarily being medicine itself, um, which is uh, a separate issue. It's the utility would be, uh, for example, um, it's antimicrobial properties in the hand sanitizer used in the hospital. It's not whiskey necessarily. It would be more a, a high proof a distilled spirit to be used for that. And in herbal medicine, again, step one is take some neutral spirit and add your herbs to it to extract its medicinal qualities. So there's utility there. Now, as far as should should one drink whiskey in order to maintain health? This is where 
every day it seems there's a new medical and scientific study that contradicts the last one. One day it gives you brain cancer. The next day, um, you know, a glass of day cures brain cancer or something. And that, that tends to go back and forth. There are, I think, some studies that look at like a moderate consumption regularly seems to um, not shorten life. <laughs> Nobody recommends that you start drinking to become healthier, but there are studies that seem to show that um, moderate use of alcohol doesn't necessarily result in extended life. However, people live a little bit longer who do moderately consume. And that might be just because those people tend to be more social and they form more relationships, which is definitely shown to correlate with longer life. Um, there people who drink tend to be um, more social. They tend to be in relationships and um, maybe, maybe just a little bit happier and uh, live a little longer because of that. So, you know, I, I say, you know, don't start drinking in order to get healthy, but um, moderate consumption doesn't look like it's as terrible for you as drinking to obsess excess. What did you learn researching this book that you didn't know, or what was the aha moment for you? Really the, the biggest, the thing that um, made me <laughs> the most, wow. <laughs> yeah. I wrote a book. I can't speak though. So um, the, the biggest wow moment of learning about the history of alcohol and medicine was reading about the history of alchemy and how the goal was to extract medicines from all different substances. And that in that context, when they distilled wine, what they created was um, the essential oil of wine. They created the medicine of wine. There was no concept that there were concentrating the alcohol in wine. They were just extracting the medicine from it. So the, act of distilling wine and, and commenting on its properties, this is really the ultimate result of a thousand years of what was considered science at the time uh, of the study of alchemy. They really achieved one of the, the greatest feats and <laughs> really the only worthwhile one <laughs> of the history of alchemy uh, in that moment. But that's why in it, we can, I think, understand from a modern perspective that uh, why alcohol would be useful uh, in medicine, but the understanding that distilled alcohol was medicine, it was created as medicine and only used as medicine initially was a really big moment and, and um, discovery for me. And we still use alcohol to this day in some medicines, uh, cough syrups and things like that, right? Absolutely. It's, it's still useful, turns out. Um, for a lot of cases, particularly with antibiotics, we've got better medicine than we used to have to cure a lot of stuff. But alcohol can still be uh, a useful tool in the practice of medicine. Largely because it works as a solvent and helps break down other things, which is why uh, it gets the uh, essences out of uh, botanicals and things like that by breaking them down. Exactly. I, I see you've learned something from the book. Yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a great solvent, a near, a near universal solvent. And that's a large part of its utility from modern day to, to ancient day. It's, its antimicrobial properties are, are the other big one of alcohol. But yeah, you got it. Tell me about the Food and Drug Act of 1906. Sure. The Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906 is really one of the most important pieces of American legislation ever passed, I, I would say. And learning about that was, was really fun and interesting. Before this act, um, other countries around the world had passed some safe food regulations, but the United States was more um, celebrating industry rather than safety. And so not only could the whiskey be adulterated and, and false, but also milk and meat. And I had things like formaldehyde and all this um, nasty stuff in, in food. And the Pure Food and Drug Act was really passed as a, a false advertising law. It was basically 
said, you know, if you're putting formaldehyde in your meat, you have to declare it. <laughs> and um, it uh, really changed the way that medicine and alcohol and food um, were advertised. And so the food became, you know, more pure as we would see it today after those acts. And that's just one of several pieces of legislation that led to the FDA eventually and made our food and drinks um, reliably advertised as well as, you know, made according to safe standards. And the other ones were the Bottled and Bond Act of 1897 and the, uh, the Taft Declaration on what whiskey really is. Absolutely. Yeah, people say that the Bottled and Bond Act um, was the first piece of uh, food safety legislation, um, but it was for whiskey. And there were uh, local and regional ones, as far as I know, but in the process of leading to the Pure Food and Drug Act, which was more significant, and then they realized they had to define whiskey <laughs> because they had, they had forgot to do that, and that uh, led us to the Taft Act. It's like, okay, whiskey's not made from molasses. That's something else. Camper English's new book, Doctors and Distillers, is available at most online booksellers and through your local independent bookstore, too. That's Whiskey Cast in Depth. It's brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best kept secret. Hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskeys comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. Let's start with the Gordon and McPhail private collection, Milton 1949, that I mentioned during the news. Once again, it's a 72-year-old single malt matured in a first-fill sherry punch and cask, and even after 72 years, it's still a strong 48.6% ABV. The nose has citrusy notes of oranges and lemon zest, along with touches of vanilla beans, potpourri and subtle spices, and tree fruits. The taste is fruity and vibrant, with touches of butterscotch, tropical fruits, nutmeg, a hint of cinnamon, and touches of apple cobbler and honeycomb. The finish is long, with a kiss of smoke, along with apple cobbler, toffee, and honey. It's outstanding. I'm scoring the Gordon and McPhail Private Collection Milton 1949 a 96. We can pair this one with another recent release from Gordon and McPhail, the Mr. George Legacy 2nd Edition 1957 Glen Grant, named in honor of the late George Urquhart. This one spent 64 years in a first fill sherry butt. It's bottled at 56.1% ABV. The nose has notes of Christmas cake orange marmalade, baking spices, and hints of molasses and candle wax. The taste is full of cherries, a hint of pipe tobacco, menthol, and hints of apples, orange peel, and baking spices that come alive leading into the finish. It's long with touches of tree fruits and charred oak as well. I'm also scoring the Gordon and McPhail Mr. George Legacy 2nd Edition 1957 Glen Grant a 96. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey, a 100-time award-winning Maryland-style rye. With a determined focus to create the best rye whiskey imaginable, their team of distillers crafts each spirit with a nod to both tradition and innovation. Find their signature, double oak, cask strength, or reserve series rise, as well as their line of premium rye whiskey canned cocktails at a retailer near you. Just visit sagamorespirit.com slash find dash rye. Please drink responsibly. I received samples of the Glen Turret's core range recently. Let's take a look now at the Glen Turret 12-year-old 2021 release. It's bottled at 46% ABV, and the nose has a nice barley sugar maltiness balanced by touches of ginger, charred oak, and orange peel. The taste is thick and creamy with notes of barley sugar, cinnamon, honey, and a hint of orange peel. The finish, long and gentle with lingering spices and honey sweetness. I'm scoring the Glen Turret 12-year-old a 94. Finally, Woodford Reserve is out with the 2022 edition of its Batch Proof Bourbon. 
It's the same whiskey that goes into the standard Woodford Reserve bourbon, just bottled at barrel strength. This year's edition comes in at 59.2% ABV. The nose has notes of vanilla, toasted oak, honey, and a hint of caramel candy. The taste is sweet with a subtle bite of black pepper and touches of vanilla, toasted oak, caramel, and chocolate. The finish is long and smooth, and I'm scoring the 2022 Woodford Reserve Batch Proof a 94. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. I'll be adding these whiskeys to our searchable list of more than 3,300 different whiskeys from all over the world. You can search by a whiskey's name, country, style, or even the score I gave it. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Kentucky and Ireland have plenty in common. Two homes of horse racing. Mm -hmm. Bluegrass music is said to have Irish roots. Um, Okay, it's not the longest list. But the Redbreast Kentucky Oak Edition only strengthens the bond. Finished in sustainably sourced Kentucky Oak for a captivating nose and round taste. I see a triple crown in this thoroughbred's future. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. Redbreast. Pass it on. Let's open up the inbox now for Your Voice, presented by Scarabus, Isla Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. Last week's letter from Greg Miller asking for a polycarbonate Glencairn whiskey glass that could be used for camping, travel, or by the pool sparked a lot of interest. And, of course, a Twitter poll. In fact, we've never had a response like this to one of our Twitter polls before. More than 250 of you shared your opinions, and in the end, Greg is not alone. 71% of those who answered the survey liked the idea. Some even added a few suggestions for things like a stainless steel version instead of polycarbonate. Here are some of your responses. From Derek Custer, Considering I just smashed two to a million pieces a couple of weeks ago, definitely. From at dram underscore we, please do. I tried the silicone version, and the taste tainted every pore. PC shouldn't affect flavor. Boskurt Karasu replied with a retweet of a tweet he used to send Glencairn Crystal every year. When are we going to see a stainless steel travel-friendly Glencairn glass? Soon we'll be packing for another whiskey trip and need one so bad. Now, others pointed out that Glencairn already sells a set of two glasses with a travel case. And, to be honest, I have one of those here at home, but it rarely ever leaves the house. The biggest concern was over using any form of plastic because of the environmental impact. And Billy McLeod was one of those suggesting an alternative. Stainless I'd take. Otherwise, I'll just use a Yeti for poolside. Thanks to everyone who shared their comments with us, along with your votes. We have passed on the results to the folks at Glencairn Crystal, and while I wouldn't get your hopes up, one never knows. If there's anything else you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always get in touch with us on social media. Look for WhiskeyCast on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can also email us, comments at whiskeycast.com. Your voice is presented by Scarabus, the Isla single malt from Hunter Lang and Company that celebrates all of Isla's natural gifts in one bottle. Only those who seek shall find Scarabus. Start your search today at hunterlang.com. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and people who make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. I talked about the Gordon and McPhail private collection Milton from 1949 earlier in this podcast. While it's not unusual for distilleries to change names over the years, it's rare for them to switch from one to another and then back again twice. What we call Strath Isla today started out as Milltown Distillery back in 1786, but the owner soon changed it to Milton. It stayed that way until 1870, when the owners changed the name to Strathyla for the first time. In 1890, the owners went back to calling it Milton, and after Chivas Brothers bought the distillery out of bankruptcy in 1950, 
They changed the name back to Strathyla for good in 1951. That's all according to the Malt Whiskey Yearbook's 2022 edition, which also gives us a few other distillery name changes over the years. For instance, Glenn Goyne's original name was Burnfoot Distillery from 1833 to 1876, when it became Glen Gwynn Distillery, and then changed to Glen Goyne in 1905. I shared my tasting notes for the Glen Turret 12-year-old a few minutes ago. It's widely considered to be the oldest distillery in Scotland, but it didn't always have that name. It was called Hosh Distillery when it opened in 1775, and kept that name for 100 years until it became Glen Turret in 1875. And Dalwhinnie Distillery was originally known as Strath Spey when it opened. It didn't take on its current name until 1898. If you have something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, an 18th century style of premium Irish whiskey blended from single pot still and single malt. Like yourself, it's one of life's treasured rarities, and what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, cocktail recipes, and of course a complete archive of all of our past episodes going all the way back to 2005. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Well, folks, we're nearing the end of another great episode of Whiskey Cast, which means you're probably craving some whiskey. Head on over to Dewars.com or your local retailer to discover what makes Dewars the most awarded blended Scotch whiskey in the world. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. You know, people always ask me, does Redbreast go better with ice or without? Would it go well with figs? dark chocolate, apple crumble. Is there one particular thing I should enjoy it with? I tell them, yeah, other people. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2022, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, Please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.